Hello all, welcome to another episode of Synthesis with the School of Smirk, where we discuss and identify, investigate the places where art and religion meet, um, identifying the behaviors, the nature that are shared by the truths that pervade these two <clears throat> aspects of the life experience. And in doing so, gain an ability to more readily utilize, comprehend, and apply these two functions, the function of art and the function of religion, for the most meaningful, gratifying, unique, and alive human particular experience in and with the world around us, all messages before us, and in interaction with posterity coming. So... <clears throat> Today, we will be synthesizing some metaphysical concepts, some ideas, uh, which are the religious function to offer, concepts and implications of metaphysical premises, with a sonnet by William Shakespeare. Um, I'll start by reciting the sonnet, and then we'll get into the discussion a little bit. Um, so it's sonnet number 71. Uh, the sonnet reads, No longer mourn me when I am dead, Then you shall hear the surly sullen bell Give warning to the world that I have fled From this vile world with vilest worms to dwell. Nay, if you read this line, remember not the hand that wrote it. For I love you so, that in your sweet thoughts would I be forgot, if thinking on me should make you woe. Oh, if, I say, you should look upon this verse, when I, perhaps, compounded am with clay. Do not so much as my poor name rehearse, but let your love even with my life decay. Lest the wise world look into your moan and mock you with me when I am gone. So that's the sonnet. Um, and so I'll now read through it again. Um, and sort of what I'll do is, first of all, I'll, I'll explain. Um, I'll, I'll point towards, guide you to seeing, um, to understanding how and why. Uh, some of the particular abstract relationships, relationships between words, concepts, ideas, sentences, structures, choices made by the artist, the artist in the literary abstract contexts, uh, tools being words, syntax and semantics, how we combine these, how we combine these inside of bigger ideas, exact word choices, their exact placement. These are the means to passing. Uh, these are the means to mapping and tracking uh, irrefutably particular properties and qualities uh, which reflect in isomorphism the world around us and how it may be uniquely or irrefutably particularly related to an individual. I want to start out by saying that this sonnet, as with some of his other works, this sonnet is an explicit discussion of metaphysical messages. This is discussing um, outright the concept of deathlessness, um, the metaphysical concepts passed by the Abrahamic religions and the Greek god system, as well as most other uh, god systems, religions, spirit spiritualities. This is discussing the nature of aliveness and death, um, how it is redefined and seen in new light when we 
can understand and experience justify in self um, some of these metaphysical concepts which are passed by religions and other messengers. This is essentially an excerpt from the Book of William. Think of it as Shakespeare in this case is like um, is like a prophet or a saint or an apostle. Um, he's one of the messengers. Apostolos. Apostolos. Um, he's one of the messengers of this metaphysical information. He's a, a Latter-day Saint, you could think of, someone who has come 1,500 years after, let's say, the most recent prophet, uh, 4,000 years after the advent of um, the, the train of thought that led to that, and then 4,000 years before that, the Greek god system, which had, you know, started from, again, somewhere else. All of these were, they're all links in a chain to pass this message. And so we could think of this as an excerpt from a text which is passing metaphysical messages, is passing information about the nature of the universe and of humanity, uh, discussing fundamental experiences that we all share. Um, as such, it's, it's metaphysical text. He uses art just as does religion used use literature and text the this are abstract context in order to pass infinity including discussing and tracking messages he uses art in order to similarly pass this message um pass messages about these major concepts so he's yeah um He's one of the one of the messengers, and you could think of this in that way, the same way we would think of the Book of Luke or the Book of John. If we could think of the writing of Saint Augustine or whatever other you want to think of religious text, this is this is that this is like an an excerpt, a part of work which is explicitly passing metaphysical messages, um, and these messages are both the deathlessness, which is. Uh, Abrahamic and pre-Abrahamic, um, which is an implication of infinity, that we're all part of one thing. So if we physically no longer exist, this doesn't, this means that there is a change in our nature, but not um, some sort of elimination. This is sort of an entropic immortality idea. Um, and, um, and then he also discusses here the more explicitly Abrahamic concept of immortality, which is that any type of interaction is life itself. Um, according to the implications of infinity, any type of interaction is life itself. Any thing of any state or nature is has equally limitless potential for meaning and consequence. That is, energy is equivalent. Thought is light. And the self physical is equivalent to the self psychological, the thoughts. Our material is our energy, our energy is equivalent to our material, and we, therefore, should we preserve, as the apostles did, uh, should we pass the message in any way, whether it's with the energy of sound coming from our voice or by preserving it in abstract context, like writing, um, should we preserve the word? Should we spread the unique light? Some, a thought that is uniquely our own, our irrefutably particular way of being related to the universe, um, revealed to consciousness, and therefore able to be preserved, to be tracked and mapped, to be notated as thought in the word, the written word, writing it down in art, a space in which thing infinity can be included and discussed and therefore irrefutable particularity and infinitely specific truth of self and how that truth is defined by relationship to all other things unique then we as our energy of self preserved despite physical death can come into interaction with the world into posterity in new conditions and therefore to interact in an otherwise impossible future, and therefore to live as any type of interaction is life itself. Um, so we see that 
Shakespeare functions like a, re a religious speaker or a teacher, um, is a messenger, apostolos, um, from sending, um, that he is using art to explicitly discuss, to definitely discuss metaphysical messages about the nature of life and death, and how a major premise or principle, uh, a context for uh, most beneficial context to understand ourselves as existing in, based on our species particularity, can um, can change, can redefine these these major ideas that we all share and that we all uh, think about, um, and experience the influences of. He is um, j he's using art exactly how religion, religious texts use art. They use it in order, through the written word, in order to articulate, discuss the universe as it may be tracked or mapped when including this beyond consciousness, this non-limited, this infinity context, which we all recognize, which humans have always taken account of, and yet which they require the offering and the guidance of religion and other metaphysical voices, um, metaphysical light, in order to reconcile in consciousness. Um, so we see in his work the wisdom and also the discussion and mention of the wisdom, which is that type of knowledge which one receives, which one understands when interacting with the world around them in a way which reflects having reconciled infinity in their consciousness. This is wisdom, the type of knowledge or truth that we find when we have reconciled infinity in our consciousness. This is what is being passed, and this is what we require art to allow us to pass. So let's just get into it a little bit. Um, he says, no longer mourn me when I am dead. So, boom, first sentence, we are talking about death. We're talking about death, yet we're, we see what type of major effect does what we're going to be discussing does what is going to be passed, what is he telling us is the change from which could be deduced, deduced that which caused the change. He's telling us that death is no longer something to be sad about, to mourn about. That's the first thing, first sentence. Again, remember, I'm going to be pointing out irrefutably particular definite relationships between the components of this abstract context, this literature, this sonnet, um, and I'll be pointing out many. I'll be guiding you to seeing how these relationships are particularly arranged and utilized and chosen in order to pass very specific messages that aren't up to us, but as exactly what they are, as irrefutably particular relationships between things, allow us, if we should look rigorously, selflessly enough, to see what they most particularly are and therefore to begin to interact with Shakespeare, with his unique life, with his thought that preserved and therefore to have something to interpret if we look from our own intentions and predefinitions and assumptions we end up seeing what we want to see we end up just interacting with um, ourselves really which isn't a terrible thing but it's definitely not interpreting Shakespeare so we have to see right off the bat that the first sentence says no longer mourn me when I am dead and that this uh, from among many other things, as there's going to be many things that I don't mention, many relationships there to continue being discussed. But one of them is that, first of all, the, right off the bat, we are talking about death. There's, that's, ir that's definite, irrefutable. And that Shakespeare is telling you that it's no longer something to be mourned. Perhaps it's just saying that you shouldn't mourn him. But we're saying that this is about death and about it not being sad anymore. Or at least not being what it is, this end that we thought of it as. No longer mourn me, then you shall hear the surly sullen bell give warning to the world that I have fled. So here we see that he's chosen to show us when. When and what, why, what is the causal, what is the cause, what could be the cause of no, long, of no longer mourning? 
And what we're shown is that so no longer mourn me when I'm dead, then you should hear the surly sullen bell. So give warning to the world that I've fled. So this is to say that it's it's the bell. It's the influence of a sound. Energy itself and an inanimate object's behavior that it is something like energy, something like an inanimate thing, sound itself, the invisible. These are the particular truths of the words chosen in their arrangement. And that all of these things can give warning. They can act, they can speak, they can have real consequence. That you shall hear the surly sullen bell. You shall hear it, just the sound. But that that sound can be surly and sullen. That the bell itself can be those things. Can take on those very human attributes. Can gain those patterns which are meaningful, which we understand within the self. That is, we can identify with these inanimate things. The invisible, the unknown, the inanimate that which otherwise seems to not be able to speak, that which we've defined as not being able to speak. You hear the surly sullen bell give warning, and, that, and suddenly they warn. Suddenly they take action. Suddenly they, be, they begin to speak. It's when all of this happens, or when you understand what this means, that you will no longer mourn the death. And instead, then you, then you shall hear the surly sullen bell give warning to the world, that I have fled. It's when whatever he's trying to teach us, this metaphysical message, this idea, can turn inanimate things into speaking things, can make energy equivalent, be able to warm, can give characteristics that we understand, increased information, meaningful relationships to these things which otherwise are predefined as less than human and humanity or consciousness in some way, that all of a sudden death becomes a flea. It's a different idea. It's a change or a moving. A fled is, is a leaving. Instead of a dead, which is something like an extermination or a, a termination. And he goes on to say, fled from this vile world with vilest worms to dwell. We'll see that this vile world will come up again later. But the idea is that he would leave almost intentionally. That it's not a bad thing and perhaps it's even a good thing. He would flee the vile world that there's something wrong with this world that mourns the dead. And he indicates the type of behavior that embodies or is a manifestation of the vileness of the world which mourns death. And that is with vilest worms to dwell. That it's this world which doesn't treat energy this way, which doesn't understand death to be a fleeing, which doesn't um, treat sound and the inanimate as having equally limitless potential for meaning and value, which um, sees worms, like a, so even creatures, these other creatures, as being vile, as being disgusting. And yet he indicates that he has fled from the vile world with vilest worms, that which this vile world defines, doesn't allow to be anything but vile worms, to dwell. He goes there to stay. He goes there seemingly intentionally to stay 
having fled from something that calls them vile. Suddenly, we we start to see if we start to see what are these what why are these relationships chosen? These are definite relationships. These are unchanging, and so we look at them selflessly that we begin to see what they are from more aspects. That is everything they are not. What are they most particularly? That's the thing that's going to lead us to receiving the unique light, the message, that which this is all a reflection of. What is the world having gained all new meanings and values, the entire plexus redefined, plexus of relationships and truths and patterns, redefined by the idea, the concept which he's passing. This is a mapping or a tracking of that world. So let's go on. He says, nay, if you read this line, do not remember the hand that writ it, for I love you so that in your sweet thoughts would I be forgot if thinking on me should make you woe. Nay, if you read this line, remember not the hand that writ it, for I love you so that I in your sweet thoughts would be forgot. If thinking on me, then should make you woe. You see that I forget some of these uh, small words sometimes. Nothing is small. All of them should be considered. It's unacceptable to forget them. But it does happen. I, I like to walk around with all these sonnets in my memory. And every once in a while, certain things will drop out. Those things, however, were definitely chosen. And they do carry truth. So... Correct them. Notice the corrections um, if they're there. Use what I'm giving you, what I have in my mind, what I see written down, and how I interact with the abstract variables and relationships between them as what's being taught here. I'm showing you the way to interact with the energy of another as it's preserved in the abstract world, how to interact with the abstract world, and therefore to allow it to give you information, wisdom, knowledge, reflecting, interacting in a way which reflects reconciliation of infinity, which will then allow you to interact with the world around you in a way more inspiring, in a way which allows you to bring in the irrefutably particular truth of self as it's related to the world, the unique light, which then you might use art in order to preserve. So he says, nay, if you read this line, remember not the hand that writ it, for I love you so that I in your sweet thoughts would be forgot. If thinking on me, then should make you woe. So, if you read this line, remember not the hand that writ it. He shows you right away that this is not about the hand, physical. It's not even about him. Remember not the hand that writ it. He doesn't want you to know William Shakespeare or his physical body or anything like that. So immediately we see that it's not about the physical. It's not about the hand. For I love you so, and there we also see that then, this is about a type of love, or the instigation for a type of love. That I, so he talks about himself, his the consciousness which is I, this being that recognizes its own uniqueness. I, in your sweet thoughts, would be forgot if thinking on me should make you well. This is very important, and it's one of multiple instances where this happens, where there's a dual message passed by the choice of words. So we see that if you read this, if you're interacting with this abstract world, which is his unique self preserved, don't remember his physical self. And it's because of whatever's bringing up this discussion, this, this type of love that he has. That's what he's trying to pass. For I love you so. I, he loves us in such a way. What would make unconditional love? What would make a love greater? That I, in your sweet thoughts, so that is, there's distinct types of thoughts um, that perhaps the goal or what he's trying to do more than it has anything to do with himself is to give us a type of thoughts, which is beneficial, is to give us a reason to have the, these sweet thoughts. It's in those which is his goal that he's 
happy and willing to be forgot if thinking on him should make you woe. So, first of all, here's the first meaning. In those thoughts, would he be forgot? That is, he would be forgotten if thinking on him should make you woe, because that means you wouldn't have gotten the message. If thinking on him would make you mourn, like in the beginning, the dead, in your sweet thoughts, he would be forgot. That is, he is this message that he's passing. He is the, the energy of self preserved in the abstract context. Further, he's saying he would prefer, or it would be better, if he was not there. If there was no Shakespeare at all. If... if you don't receive his message. If you don't receive his message, it's better that he's not there at all. He would, he has such unconditional love for you. There's something, the source of all this, this whole discussion and this whole redefinition of life and death and the reason he wants to pass it, that it would be better he's not there at all or his, for sure his message isn't there. That which is uniquely him is not there. If thinking on him should bring you woe. He should make you woe. He's not trying. He's doing everything but that. He's attempting to teach you, and he himself, in his uniqueness, would cease to exist if thinking on him should bring you woe. Okay. Then, then he says, and this is quite uh, fantastic uh, use of compositional device, oh, I, uh, no, he says, oh, if I say, in parentheses. So he shows you that it is him. Now we say, if, he says, if I say, he's saying that it's him saying. He's the one in there. He's in the writing, the bare island of the book. We'll do another one on Prospero's epilogue. But if I say, he shows you that it's him. This is him. He's showing you that where the I is. It's, it's in the O and the F. It's in the words. It's in the relationships chosen, which irrefutably map his unique experience. It's the energy of his self, equal in potential meaning, value, truth, consequence to his physical self, his hand, here, in the abstract. Um, if I say... You should look upon this verse. Remember the upon just like we remembered the vile, the vile, wor uh, the vile world. We're also going to remember that you can look upon this verse. We've got, we've had read this line already. And now if you look upon this verse. If I say, he shows you that it's, it's him. You look upon this verse. It's a way of looking at this world, the abstract world, a way of looking upon it. When I, again, he refers to the I, he's starting to identify where, he's starting to clear, clarify and emphasize that we're not only discussing life and death, but what is the nature of the truth of self? What, what is the self and how does this play a role? When I, perhaps, he puts again, in parentheses for you to show you that this is what's being discussed. What's in question is this, perhaps when I, perhaps compounded damn with clay in the burial process, are we, he's saying that perhaps it isn't his I that is buried. Perhaps his I, the unique truth of himself, energetic, just like the physical, is here in the O oh, and the if I say, when I perhaps it's in question compounded and with clay. So he says, Oh, if I say, you should look upon this verse, interact with the writing. When I perhaps reminding you, where's the question? It's that the I and life perhaps are not compounded with clay, are not buried. Do not so much as my name rehearse. He again shows it's not his hand. It's not his name. 
it's not his physical entity that um, is being discussed. It's what makes him love you so. It what, it's what makes him selfless, that it's not about him being remembered. That, in fact, he can't be remembered, he can't be interacted with, if this is not understood. That it is sweet thoughts which he's going after. That I and your sweet thoughts would be forgot, thinking on me should make you well. So, oh, if I say you should look upon this verse when I, perhaps, compounded it with clay, do not so much as my name rehearse. That's not where to pay attention. It's not about mourning. It's not about being made to woe because there's something that's bringing love that's making the energy of a bell be able to give warning that's making inanimate objects be able to gain um, characteristics that are influential and we're able to meaningfully identify with um, that perhaps we're not compounded with clay that perhaps our I is something else do not so much as my name rehearse and it makes it makes this need to be preserved uh, physically as a name, as a hand, um, as a memory. Uh, he says, do not so much as my name rehearse, but let your love even with my life decay. And here's another sort of double meaning sentence. And again, it refers to love right after the other one which were shown that there's types of love or degrees of love. Whatever the message being passed is, that which also removes death from a sadness and makes it a fleeing from viler things. Let your love, even as my life decay, even with my life decay. We see that whatever their love is, it's not the love that he has. Let your love even as my life decay. If you understand, again, this is a question of life and death, if you understand what his life is, if you get the message that makes his life this, his interaction of any type, this, if I say he's here interacting with you, he's showing you that perhaps he's not compounded with clay. Let your love even with my life decay. If you understand that his life is interaction through the abstract, through the word preserved, that he's really interacting with you if you don't look upon but into his verse, if you look selflessly, if you love him as he loves you so, then your love, even with his life, will decay. That is, if you understand that his life is interaction into posterity that's happening right now as you're looking into his verse, not upon it. You will see that your love doesn't decay. In fact, your love will become unconditional and neither does his life, so they're even. But if you have this love that mourns at death, if you have this love that's conditional, that needs the physical hand, that believes one aspect or that interacts with one aspect with bias and assumption and definition over the other, then let that decay. Let that decay, and that's why decay was chosen, let that disintegrate with the hundred-year physical. That's as far as that love is useful. That's as far as that love is significant here. Let your love even with my life decay. That is, we have to learn that there's a love that doesn't fade, that's unconditional, that's timeless. We'll do Sonnet 116 next. Um, we have to realize that there's a something that causes that that also causes deathlessness. That also justifies the interaction of energy as the real living, the interaction of self into posterity, immortally. Um, that the other type of love, this unconscious, this non-metaphysically informed, non-wise, vile love, is one which will decay with the decaying body. But that, he 
he says, do not so much as my name rehearse, but let your love even as my life decay. Yeah, and that is, he says, do not so much my name rehearse. Again, don't fixate on the physical, on the preserved, defined memory of the self and what it was. But let your love, even as my life, even with my life decay, that is, your love doesn't need to leave. You don't need to rehearse this name, but bring it with you. Unconditionally love this self as it is energetic and all of the things, unconditionally learn the message being taught that makes life an interaction of any kind that makes any thing of any appearance state or nature equal and limitless potential as are the implications of infinity come into interaction selfless and therefore reveal your irrefutably particular way of being related to fundamental relationships between other things as this is this irrefutably particular way of all things being related is the ever-changing uniqueness in each thing according to the implications of infinity so he wants that vile love, even as his physical body, to be eliminated. Don't rehearse the names, don't mourn. But also realize that life is redefined here by this metaphysical message being taught, and that so is love. That those two don't decay. They evenly don't decay, uh, having received this message being passed by this prophet or saint or apostle this messenger who is using art just as religious text does in order to pass infinity including concepts that are incredibly beneficial and a function for humanity to deal with these major concepts like life death interacting with things of all different appearances energetic physical the visible and the invisible um how and why to understand them, therefore to use them and see how their implications spread and redefine everything in life to allow us to interact most beneficially in, the, in and with the world around us using that which humans in particular have the ability to perceive as their surroundings and therefore which we're designed to receive from. We find ourselves taking account of the manifestations of infinity, of indefinableness or bothness or unknowableness and we are aware of uniqueness irrefutable particularity and everything and this is seemingly contradictory and it causes many of our problems so one of the functions of religion is to eliminate those problems to give you a sense of reconciliation with m removal of self-doubt despite our ever taking account of those um those manifestations of our being in an infinite context the manifestations of infinity in our in our world, the uncontrollable, indefinable, unknowable, enigmatic factors and forces, and yet there's more than that. Once we fought, once we gain that energy, once we no longer are afraid and isolate, we come into a more selfless interaction with the world around us. With these concepts themselves, we start to see that, in fact, we can not they not only relieve us of these pains and confusions and doubts senses of isolation, ego fear. But they can allow us, should we consider them more and their implications more, to justify interaction selfless, which is therefore a more gratifying, uh, meaningful, uh, rebirthing interaction, uh, revealing the knowledge called wisdom, which is that which we receive once we've reconciled infinity and consciousness, the type of information or thought that's what's being passed here. It's when we suddenly realize there are certain implications like deathlessness or even immortality should energy be equivocated and then that be preserved in the abstract context, which is a mapping of the world that includes infinity, is able to include infinity. Um, 
that can then interact in a in a posterity in the, with the same according to the implication of infinity consequence reality meaning truth as the physical self we start to see how art and religion are part of the same thing the one's teachings are in the behaviors and nature that are inherent in the other um how the art is a reflection or a mapping of a world which includes infinity. So let's get to the last line, Son 71. So he gets, and we could recite it all to remember what we were, there's a couple of things we were trying to remember. No longer mourn me when I am dead, then you shall hear the surly sullen bell give warning to the world that I fled from this vile world with vilest worms to dwell. <clears throat> Nay, if you read this line, remember not the hand that writ it, for I love you so that in your, that I in your sweet thoughts would be forgot if thinking on me should make you woe. Oh, if I say, I say, you should look upon this verse when I, perhaps, compounded am with clay, do not so much as my name rehearse, but let your love even with my life decay. And here's the last line. Lest the wise world Look into your moan and mock you with me when I am gone. So we see that here's the contradiction between the vile world and the wise world. We're shown those who get this message, those who receive this message, who understand how, what is, who are able to deduce from selfless investigation of the irrefutable particular relationships between these abstract variables, this metaphysical concept. are the wise world. And what they do is they would look into, not upon. So just as we look upon the energy, the, the unique, irrefutably particular energetic truth of Shakespeare, which is in the writing, in the verse, in the line, the wise world, the one that understands and acts according to or reflects having reconciled this metaphysical concept of, infin of infinity and consciousness, would look into not upon, because upon defines, it has a, has a structure already. This rather looks into, it allows it to be pervaded by the energy of giving, selflessness. It looks into your moan. Ah, again, a sound, back to the bell. It looks into a moan, even a sound, even the sound of an antagonist, the one who doesn't understand this point, the one that makes the world vile, the one that mourns, the one that doesn't understand this. They would still look into even you, the antagonist, and they would look into you as your sound. That is the energetic aspect of a self, is the sound we make. That is the energetic appearance of a thought, just like the writing we're discussing. The implication of the Abrahamic word as a path to immortality. Uh, the Let's say the second, uh, the second level of deathlessness in, in this religious function. Um, after that, a more entropic one. Um, that they they would look into you, like to sort of say the antagonist in this situation, and into the aspect of you that's energetic. That these are the tendencies, these are the behaviors of the wise world. Lest the wise world look into, not upon, your moan, and mock you with me. He's showing it's him that's mocking with the wise world, those who understand the message, when he is gone. That is, there will be an interaction definite by him, his me, his I, that he said, I say, if I perhaps, he, me, will mock you with me, the wise world, all those who understand the, this message, this, that deathlessness and immortality in the word, real interaction, consequential, redefining, rebirthing, 
meaning increasing aliveness is possible after being gone because there is no dead it's having fled to dwell elsewhere and being gone and yet you're still able to mock you're still able to interact just like that bell gives warning lest the wise world look into your moan the wise world and shakespeare who has interacted with them who is among them will look into your energy because that's how those who have reconciled this message treat they will look into the antagonist who doesn't know and mock there's also an implication of like a smirk or a playfulness here mock you with me see that you've missed it after all of this attempts and energy from across time from metaphysical messengers when he is gone that he despite being physically gone continues to interact and that's the message here um so i hope this uh this reconciliation of art and religion this manner of there being metaphysical messages in the abstract world um this idea that or and illustration of how an abstract context uh an irrefutably particular set of relationships energetic between abstract variables can map and track a world like the world around us the approach well mundane which is infinity including i hope this illustration of how these two interact how the one functions within the other how the teachings of one is inherent in and embodied by the behaviors of the other i hope this can help you to begin to use both art and religion the art which is the manner of religion's passing wisdom uh information metaphysical light truth which is uh the world as it is affected or influenced by or including infinity um and art the function the means to human expression which allows us to include irrefutable particularity and to explicitly um the the infinite specificity of your field of particularity and um to track infinity itself to allow it into the process by of of our expression by including or embodying acting according to the implications of infinity in our creation process with the energetic components which are equivocated by the infinity that we're passing i hope that this manner of reconciling these two aspects of the human experience can help you to even slightly even gain a little bit of sympathy a little sweetness of thought when you go to interact with its manifestations with the vast resources of artistic creation and of spiritual religious creation metaphysical message passing of any type any type philosophy philosophy from any place or time or period um, i hope it could help you to more readily interact with those to receive from them um, that which is not to you, that which is otherwise impossible, which can only be when you come into real interaction with the unique light, the truth of others, as it may be preserved in art, um, in equally consequential and potentially immortal, should we look at it with loving, selfless, sympathetic eyes. Um, aspect of self. Uh, a truth of self which can live beyond the physical. Thanks for joining.